This episode of the Nickelodeon Animation Podcast is brought to you by White Lightning Chalk. Magic chalk that lets you draw things that'll come to life. Hey, do something fancy with the chalk! It's a snap. Just draw whatever you want, erase it, and then travel through the portal to the chalk zone. You are not gonna believe this. Warning, steer clear of the kilt-wearing guardian of the magic chalk mines, the craniacs, and ugly drawings you once drew who will blame you for being ugly and will want you to destroy them. I didn't mean it to look like that. Who's got the chalk, the chalk, chalk, chalk zone? Now you do with the all-new White Lightning Chalk. Not available at any retail store. Nick, 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 Nick. Nickelodeon! From Nickelodeon Studios in Burbank, California, this is the Nickelodeon Animation Podcast. Hi, I'm your host, Hector Navarro. Welcome to the podcast. My guest today is going to give us a perspective that we don't normally get on the Nickelodeon Animation Podcast, and that is one of the producer. He got his start in television at MTV in 1980, where he led the team that developed the I Want My MTV ad campaign. He then moved over to Nickelodeon, a struggling cable channel, and was part of the team that turned it into the highest rated kids network in six months. After being president of Hanna-Barbera for most of the 90s, he founded Frederator Studios in 1997, which gave us classic cartoon hits like The Fairly Odd Parents, Chalk Zone, My Life as a Teenage Robot, Adventure Time, and Bravest Warriors. According to Wikipedia, he's a serial entrepreneur, and I honestly cannot think of a better way to describe Mr. Fred Seibert. Fred, thank you so much for being here. This is thrilled to be here. A real, a real pleasure. What kind of stuff did you love growing up? Oh, I love TV animation. Yeah. I mean, it's really as simple as that. First of all, you know, I'm old enough that my family was the first one on the block to have a television set. And so I became a television addict at an extremely young age, which is why I can't complain when my boys watch television when they were growing up. Yeah. And before there was TV animation, I saw all of the theatrical stuff that had been repurposed for television in the early 50s. I saw the very first TV animations that were done, Crusader Rabbit, that was done by Jay Ward, who eventually went on to do Rocky and Bullwinkle. Mm -hmm. And then, like everyone else in my generation, I was seven years old when Hanna-Barbera came out with their first most famous series. It wasn't their first series, but their most famous one, Huckleberry Hound Show, which was a mix of Huckleberry Hound in the first slot, Mm -hmm. Pixie and Dixie in the second Mm -hmm. slot, and Yogi Bear in the third slot. Breakout star. Yeah, and they they were the rock star cartoon characters of my age until... When I was nine years old, they came out with the Flintstones, the first primetime adult animation show. Not so much when you look at it in retrospect. Yeah. And I just became fanaticized. You know, I thought it was the greatest thing. My best friend, who's an artist that I continue to work with 50 years later, <laughs> would uh, charge us a dollar to draw Fred Flintstone on our sweatshirts. <laughs> and that was when it, it was actually the first time that it dawned on me that an actual human being drew a cartoon. So you've always been a Hanna-Barbera guy. Yep. There's pros and cons to what Hanna-Barbera was doing for animation in general back then, but I loved Hanna-Barbera growing up. Well, you know, in those days, we had a situation where the Walt Disney Company was the dominant force in the everyday mainstream, main street human beings view of what animation was. Absolutely. And Walt, being a natural entrepreneur, knew how to bring his, not just the story of the film stories, but the story of what he did for a living, he knew how to bring it out into the world, and he was a real natural at it. When the film studio stopped making theatrical shorts in the early 50s and started closing up all their units, a really interesting thing happened, which is here was an industry that literally had never existed, and all of these innovative talents who populated that industry and had literally invented it were all out of work. Mm -hmm. And one by one, they were scrambling to find all sorts of work. And among the scramblers were Joe Barbera and Bill Hanna. Yeah. And they set up Hanna-Barbera as one of a bunch of companies. What most of the other companies didn't have was Bill Hanna. Bill Hanna was a genius, not only as the best timing director that the business maybe has ever seen, (laughs) but he came from an engineering family, and he had had on his mind for years how to make animation cost-effective so that the prices could be lowered. And they went and did it. 
you know, with uh, Rough and Ready, Huckleberry Hound, all those other shows. Mm -hmm. And what was different about Joe and Bill is they weren't natural entrepreneurs. They were just trying to survive. They were 48 years old when they started the studio. Yeah. They hired the cream of the crop. Tex Avery, Michael Maltese, like dozens of names that most people don't know, but they didn't know how to tell the story. Mm -hmm. And when the press started coming out saying, well, what you do is junk. Sure. You know, real animation is what Disney does or what Looney Tunes were, or what you did with Tom and Jerry. They just remained silent. They yeah. basically said, well, our stuff is successful, you know, go jump in a lake, yeah. you know, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And that haunted them for the entire existence of the studio that they were lower quality. Mm -hmm. Leave out the fact that the whole world was going to a more spare world, not just in animation or in filmmaking. Right. But, uh, you know, I come out of the pop music world. And if you looked at the pop music that was being made in the early 50s, it was lush, it was orchestral, it was arranged, there were background singers. And by the time a Hanna-Barbera came up, there were blues bands, rock bands, pop bands, like, you know, what we now call garage bands, yeah. which were three people who could barely play their instruments, and yet they were making highly successful stuff. And Hanna-Barbera and the animation they do is just part of that overall cultural trend, but they didn't know how to tell the story, and, and they got slagged with it for 40, 50, to some days this year, you know, 100 yeah. years later. It's unbelievable. For my money, there's nothing better than a repeating Hanna-Barbera background. There is something so comforting and cool and classic <laughs> cartoony to me. It's classic no, I, to me. It's iconic. I, I love, love it. that stuff. Yeah. I, I will tell you that what they did was they simplified the medium in a way that was unacceptable to professionals. Yes. And the truth was just the opposite, which is they made the business safe for, for professionals. Yes. Where they could bring their extraordinary talents to an even wider audience than they had during the theatrical days. And uh, we are the living results of it. You know, the stuff that's done here at Nickelodeon over at Cartoon Network, even at Disney, is all the results of the innovations that Joe and Bill brought to the table. Where did your love of music come from? Oh, gosh, I don't know. I, I guess for my dad. You know, my dad was a saxophone and flute player mm -hmm. and a pharmacist, as was my mom. And in fact, my whole family is filled with, you know, biochemists and neurosurgeons. <laughs> like, it's a science family. I knew at six years old that I would be a chemist. <laughs> but at seven years old, I begged my parents for accordion lessons, which were really popular when I was a child. And <laughs> They gave them to me, and I was in. You know, yeah. like once I was in, I was in. By the time I was 13 or 14, I played three or four different instruments. And, you know, the fulcrum moment of my life was in February 1964, the Beatles came to America, played on television. Mm -hmm. And without my knowing it, actually, lightning struck. Mm -hmm. And like every other kid, I went out and got a guitar. And just the same way that now every kid has a Snapchat account, <laughs> at that point, everyone had a band. And I started what was the first of many bands that I had over the next several years. Yeah. And uh, interesting, I, I retained, I, I continued to be a science math kid at school mm -hmm. while having this rock band on the side. I had a popular local band on Long Island, which is where I'm from. And I went to college for chemistry. I was in class one day, six weeks in. They were teaching me how to dissect rats, which I didn't have necessarily a problem with. But I looked at my lab mate and I said, you know, I like the Beatles more than this. And I walked out and I never looked back. <laughs> and I marched out of the class and basically up to my college radio station, knocked on the door and said, what can I do here? And that mm. started like my new life. That's incredible. That's great. I mean, that that takes a lot of guts, Fred, to, to, to just walk out of a dissected rat like that. That's or stupidity. Well, or it, ignorance, yeah. <laughs> or drive, or like you know who knows. Yeah. Right. Like I had unbelievable mentors in my parents who said you must be passionate about what you do. You should do what you want to do, not what you have to do. Yeah. And I did grow up in a family that did not work to live. I grew up in a family that lived to work, and I had that gene in me, and that was that. So you are admitting you are wired differently from everybody else on Earth, then. Your work <laughs> ethic. You said you're... Well, I, I, I think, actually, you know, if you went around here at the Nickelodeon studio, you would find 
that most of the people here are mm -hmm. doing what they do because they have to do it. Yeah. And that long before they realized that there was an income in it, they did it because they had to do it. Yeah. And, you know, to me, that's one of the things that makes this business so amazing. It is made up of driven, talented, skilled people who, yes, have figured out a way to make a living and are thrilled that they are making a living doing it. But, you know, of all things being equal, if they had to do it for free, they probably would. Yeah. Absolutely. And then they would starve and then that's okay because they'd be happy and well, that's okay. You know what? There's a, there's always a job somewhere. You know, when yeah. I first got into business and I never saw myself in business, I never saw myself wearing a tie to work and in this particular job I had to wear a tie every day and I would get into fights with my colleagues and I would look at them and I go, look, I guess you really have to have this job. Yeah. But I don't. Yeah. I can always stock a shelf in a drugstore like when I grew up, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, we, we're doing what I want to do because we have to do it. And, you know, it's interesting how often you could win the fight at work when you didn't give a darn <laughs> about whether you left or not. Because there are a lot of people who are wedded to their jobs rather than to their work. And yeah. those are really different things. My innate sense of myself was I'll find something else. Mm -hmm. I'll find another way to make a living. There's got to be a better way. We have to talk about your work at MTV. And, you know, I know we have a lot of young listeners. It's kind of difficult to explain what that whole thing was, what the world was like, what the landscape was like before MTV and afterwards. And you were there leading the team that started one of the most successful ad campaigns in the history of ad campaigns, I Want My MTV. Just the style and the branding of this network. Before MTV, channels didn't have their own brand identity. And now that is completely commonplace for everything that we see. Well, you know, Bob Pittman, who was uh, the boss, and I both came out of radio. And radio at the time was a much more highly competitive thing than television. You know, the average person in the early 1980s in America yeah. had only two channels of television. But in many markets, there were dozens of radio stations. In New York City, where I grew up, there were 78 radio stations. Wow. So in order to compete, radio stations had to develop personalities. We mm -hmm. didn't call them brands in those days. They were personalities. Personalities. And those personalities were necessary because, not to get too far into weeds, the way ratings were taken was physical. People literally wrote their radio habits in a notebook <laughs> and gave it to the rating service, right? And the personality, if it was distinct enough... People would write down that they were listening to the radio station even if they weren't, right, because they recognized the station. So Bob and I came out of radio, and because we were doing music on television, we instinctively understood, not consciously necessarily, yeah. understood that our music station on television had to have a personality too. Like, yeah. that was natural to us. And over time... My job was that personality, mm -hmm. right? Like, I literally was in charge of everything other than the music videos themselves, <laughs> right? Now, that was, again, in those days, we didn't use the word branding. We eventually, my team started using that word eventually when we hired somebody out of the advertising business, and they explained that making the logo the star, yeah, right, that that was branding. We didn't know that, <laughs> right? But we were making up the rules yeah. of what became commonplace for for television branding, you know, like in real life, we were improvising our way through. In stereo, interviews, DJ, your day, world premiere videos, special music news. I want my MTV, MTV, MTV. Yeah, too much is never enough. Where did Nickelodeon enter the equation for you, and what was it back then? When I got to the Movie Channel the first day, May fifth, nineteen eighty, mm -hmm. the company had the Movie Channel and it had Nickelodeon. They had both been inherited. Uh, the parent company had a little early, early, early interactive television experience in Columbus, Ohio called Cube. And they had something called the Star Channel, mm -hmm. which was movies. And they had something go, I think it was originally called Columbus Goes Bananas, and then eventually called America Goes Bananas. Mm -hmm. And those were the precursors to Nickelodeon and the movie channel. So the day I got there, Nickelodeon already existed. 
it was boring as all get out. <laughs> it was kind of like a souped up PBS in right. their opinion. And they thought if they could make it good for kids and sell it to parents, you know, they'd be great. I had gone there with the expectation that I would work for a year because the idea of having a J-O-B just gave me hives. <laughs> I ended up staying for three, and one day uh, a thing that annoyed me in a corporate meeting happened, and I quit. Yeah. And I set up a company with my closest friend from college radio, a guy called Alan Goodman. Yep. Having no idea what we would do for a living. And uh, my boss, Bob Pittman, immediately hired us back as consultants for <laughs> one third the money. I had quit figuring I wasn't making enough money, and now I went back making <laughs> less money. I, don't, I was not too bright. And he called up one day and said, look, I really need your help with Nickelodeon. I just fired as many people as we could afford to fire uh, without the place shutting down. But we're either going to fix it mm -hmm. or they're going to close it. Because mm -hmm. it's lost what would be the equivalent of today, $300 million. And I said, okay, wh what needs to be fixed? I don't, I don't know anything about kids' TV. He said, well, Nickelodeon is the lowest rated basic cable network in America. <laughs> it had one show that got a rating every single day called You Can't Do That on Television. Right. And it had another show that would get a random good rating once a week called Mr. Wizard's World. <laughs> and everything else gets what the rating books call hash marks, <laughs> meaning they're below measurable levels. <laughs> And I said, what do you want me to do? He goes, fix it. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, I don't really know anything about television. Like, everything I've done in television to date has been an accident. <laughs> uh, Pretty successful accident, but an accident. I got to tell you something. Yeah. Uh, and you can edit this if you need to. Sure. I now say I was very proud of the work we did at MTV. I think it was amazing, yeah. actually. <laughs> but we could have made the look and sound of MTV being a bare-ass farting. <laughs> and everyone would have thought we were great, too. <laughs> right? When you are on the tail of a phenomenon, yeah. it doesn't matter what you do. Yeah. You could do everything wrong, and, like, it's going to be fine. In the air, see it blow everywhere. I didn't really like the people at Nickelodeon. They were incredibly boring, right? They were do-gooders. At least that's how it looked to me, I, sure. I should hasten to add. <laughs> and I didn't really like kids' TV. For me, cartoons started going downhill with Scooby-Doo. Like, mm -hmm. I, I liked short, funny cartoons. And while Scooby-Doo was funny, um, it was a long cartoon, yeah. which to me was more like a sitcom. And television for kids had just become worse and worse and worse, in my yeah. opinion. And at that point in my life, I was unmarried. I didn't see myself getting married or even having kids. I didn't even know that I liked kids. <laughs> so we get this assignment, and my boss, or the my client, I guess at that time, said, so, look, there's only two things I need to tell you Like as you're trying to fix this. One is, we've cut the programming budget to zero. We can't have any new programs. And, oh, by the way, we cut the marketing budget. I said, to what? He goes, to zero. Like, we can't, you know, I'm like, and you want us to do what? <laughs> so we go into the woman who at the time was the interim head, a woman named Jerry Laybourne, who eventually became the transformational leader of Nickelodeon. Wow. And she was not happy to have two MTV guys intruding on their careful children's turf. And uh, we said, okay, well, like, tell us, what, what's the deal? She said, well, you know, we can't understand it. We actually have picked great shows. They aren't boring shows. Mm -hmm. We've researched them. Nobody else has ever actually talked to kids to find out what they like. We've talked to kids across the country. Mm -hmm. We hand-selected and hand-curated these shows. We know that kids like them, and nobody will watch them. So we dug in a little bit more, and again, to be in the weeds, what we found out is that 44% of all homes that had cable mm -hmm. watched Nickelodeon at least once a week. That's great. For less than six minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> and we put together that fact that there were all of these millions of people coming by Nickelodeon and sure. not sticking around right? with the fact that they had these shows that they allegedly said were good. I had no idea. I didn't know how to judge a kid's show. <laughs> 
And I said, well, can we do some more research with kids? Can we find out why? Yeah. So they set up some groups and we went and started talking to kids. And no matter what age the kid was, they could be five, they could be 11, they could be seven, they could be four. They said, well, you know, Nick's for babies. Mm. And what we found out in our translation with people who understood such things was that if a kid didn't like a show, they decided it was for someone younger than them. Mm. And anyone who was a year younger than them or younger, they called a baby. (laughs) <laughs> right so an 11 year old thought a 10 year old was a baby and a five year old thought a four year old was a baby and they all said oh well it's for babies <laughs> we said okay so the problem isn't the shows the problem is what you're telling people about the shows mm. and what was the common format of the television world at that point was independent television or network television which is when the shows aren't running and the commercials aren't running there's promos that are saying watch this show watch it at this time watch it now it's great it's fantastic watch it a new episode and we said look you know there from our point of view there's no fun around here said oh yes you know we're always telling kids that nickelodeon is fun but you know we're not yeah So we set up what was our first rule. We said, okay, why don't we just ban the word fun? Why don't we actually start being fun? And why don't we just start having a good time at the jobs we do? And that'll translate into the work. The second thing was we went and did another analysis and we convinced the Nickelodeon people and the bosses to give us two minutes an hour where we could tell the Nickelodeon story to uh, the audience. And based on what you have told us, why don't we create an environment, a clubhouse environment, where it's no adults allowed (laughs) And it's a place where a kid can feel safe being a kid and doing the kinds of things that kids like doing. Mm -hmm. The conventional wisdom at the time was you have to get through to the parent first because they make the choices for kids. I don't know where that came from. It must have been from the 50s because (laughs) in every household I'd ever been in, the kid controlled the set. Yeah. Right? And decided what the family was going to watch until they went to bed. And then the parents got to watch what they wanted to watch. Yeah. Yeah. And so we said, why don't we just be very explicit about that? Why don't we stop talking about the shows? Why don't we stop talking about the times the shows are on? You know, kids can't tell time, right? They they actually know when every show is on based on when they get home from school. They go, yeah. well, the first thing that's on is this, and the second thing is that. I mean, they know. Mm-hmm. And so against the wisdom, even within the shop at the time, we threw out everything that they were doing. We brought in people who had never worked in television, right? I brought in another intern from my mentor, Scott Webb, who eventually became the worldwide creative director of Nickelodeon. Yeah. We brought in comedians. We brought in <laughs> radio people. We brought in musicians. And we taught them how to make rudimentary television. Mm-hmm. And we came up with a few little promises of things we wanted the kids to know about our so-called clubhouse. hmm that we were the first kids network. We were the only kids network. There we go. And this team of creative people just made the craziest stuff that you can imagine. So we started in June of 1984 on this assignment, number 30 cable network. In January of 1985, the number one number cable one. network of all cable networks. That is incredible. It was unbelievable. It's probably one of the three or four things in my career I'm most proud of. It doesn't matter where you are, when Nickelodeon let you are, better off by far, Nickelodeon. Nickelodeon. You have, with Frederator Studios, brought us shows like The Fairly Odd Parents and Chalk Zone and My Life as a Teenage Robot and Adventure Time. These are massive, massive shows that a lot of the time get passed on by other people. What's the difference? What is it that you are seeing in these projects? Do you have a philosophy about that or is it just sort of like a project by project case? I realized when I was in my late 50s what I did for a living, finally. It took me all that time. You know, George Martin got there by the time he was 40. It took me a little longer. Yeah. I realized that I was a professional fan. Yeah. That the thing that made me fall in love with the Beatles could be put to work for other folks that I wanted to be fans of. Mm -hmm. And so my philosophy, if there is one, 
<laughs> is just scouring the world for people I want to be a fan of. Yeah. And then going, can I help? Yeah. Right. And can I help you get it done, whatever it might be? And so, you know, the the poles of that in my recent life was around the time that I uh, was developing a show here at Nickelodeon called Random Cartoons. I was also living on the East Coast at the time. I had moved out of Los Angeles, and I was getting involved in the startup tech world. Mm -hmm. And I had a young intern who was, uh, when he came to work for us, was 14 years old. <laughs> and at the same time that I met Penn Ward, who was 21, David, my ex-intern, was helping us invent Channel Frederator, our first online animated video channel, and simultaneously inventing Tumblr. Interestingly, the reason I, I point them out is not only was Adventure Time a transformational success and Tumblr was a transformational success, it's that Penn and David elicited the same feelings in me you know, as a dad or an uncle or yeah. a producer, you know, whatever you <laughs> want to do it, which is these young, talented people who had something to say mm -hmm. and needed people around them to help them say it to the wider world, right? And that's probably more than any other single factor what has fueled my non-career over the decades. And I, by the way, had as much or as little knowledge in technology as I did in anime. I don't really have much knowledge in animation. Right. You know, other than when I was a kid, I liked Bugs Bunny. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I love that you said that it comes down to the creative person's voice. They have something to say. So, you know, back in the day, I made some jazz records. That's how I kind of got started because yeah. I couldn't figure out my way into the pop world. <laughs> and I was a 25-year-old white kid from Long Island working with literally 30, 40, 50-year-old world-class, primarily African-American musicians. And I was like uh, so nervous. I never knew what to do. I didn't want to say anything. These people were, they had forgotten more than I was ever going to know. And my main job as a producer, I felt, was getting them to the studio on time, mm -hmm. you know, and going take one. Yeah. You know, hitting a stopwatch <laughs> when in those days was a stopwatch. <laughs> so one day I'm in a famous recording studio with a famous recording engineer. And I'm asking him all sorts of questions about his recording decks and his his uh, microphones and everything. And yeah. he got really mad at me. And he said, look, it's none of your business. I went, uh, uh, excuse me? He goes, I don't know why you're asking me all these questions. I said, well, you know, I'm kind of interested in all the pieces and how they come to goes, yeah. don't be. You hired me because I know what I'm doing. <laughs> if you don't like what I'm doing, hire someone else. <laughs> I'm like, uh, Huh? He goes, you know, I've worked with the greatest producers in history. I'm like, yes, sir. I know, sir. I like. I, he goes, they understood that their job with those musicians out there. And I realized that moment that what my job was was to get the right musicians in the room. Mm -hmm. And then I could go home and go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, they, they didn't need me. Right. They just need me to get them in the room. Yeah. And if I picked the engineer right, they didn't need me. They'd been doing this for their whole careers. And nobody needed anyone saying, take one. Right. You know, that was going to take <laughs> care of itself. And that was really the beginning of my understanding my role. There was a, a CEO here at Nickelodeon called Herb Scannell, who's a close friend of mine. And we were making the Fairly Odd Parents under him in that generation. And one day he comes up and he says to me, uh, you know, that script, that last script of the Fairly Odd Parents, and he's blah, blah, and I go... Uh, I, I don't know what I don't know what you're talking about. Because you know the one where Timmy does. I go, yeah. Herb. Uh, I, I haven't read it. Yeah. Oh well, when you read it, I said, Herb, I've never read a script of the Fairly Odd Parents. <laughs> and he's like, Huh? He said, Aren't you the executive producer? I said, Yeah. Yeah. He goes, Well, why am I paying you? Isn't that what you do? I said, no, you're paying me because without me, you wouldn't have the Fairly Odd Parents. <laughs> I, Butch and I nurtured each other over the years. I got him here. Mm -hmm. He didn't need me. Mm -hmm. You don't need me. <laughs> you don't need to be asking questions about the script. No one does. <laughs> you guys could go home and check out, yeah. and Butch would be working harder than anybody else in the world to make his show great. 
I got out of the way. Why don't you get out of the way? Yeah. Well, needless to say, he was not very happy with me that day. <laughs> we're, we're close friends, so it, it's not a problem. But so my role as executive producer really annoys lots of people because <laughs> I actually don't get involved yeah. unless somebody needs something. Yeah. Because my job as the fan, as the professional fan, is to help them with what they need and to get out of their way. I hope I've picked the right person and that they will succeed with or without us. And by the way, if we pick right, most of them will succeed with or without us. Absolutely. I think in your career, you've picked a lot of the right people. I picked a lot of wrong ones, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> odd parents, merely odd parents. Really odd people, love odd you have to talk about the success of Bravest Warriors and Bee and Puppy Cat. And I want to ask you, why do you think that those two shows specifically have caught on like they have? You know, many years ago, the head of programming at Nickelodeon was a woman named Debbie B.C., and I really wanted to make programs. I didn't know why I wanted to make programs, <laughs> but I wanted to stop making promos and start making programs. Yeah. So I said, Debbie, like, what do you look for in a Nickelodeon show? Mm -hmm. She said, Fred, I look for the same thing that everyone looks for, great characters and great stories. And that has fueled us over at Frederator forever. Being Puppy Cat doesn't fit the conventional wisdom of what any commercially minded animation studio, network, movie studio would buy. Yeah. Right? It, it, like everything about it from the conventional wisdom is wrong. Yes. But Natasha Allegri, the creator of it, was a woman with a voice and she had great characters and great stories. And whether it is animation for the internet, animation for the feature film world, for yeah. Nickelodeon, for cartoon, it doesn't matter. What we look for is great characters and great stories. And if we are lucky enough to find them, because they're a lot harder to find than you would think, yeah, we move heaven and earth to try and make them happen. We have a project now that we're doing that needs to go unnamed based on one of the most world-famous video games of the last 30 years that we've had in our shop for 12 years without being able to get it started. Wow. But there were great characters and a great story, and eventually we, we got it going. What is some advice that you would give to young people that are listening now and going, oh my gosh, you did that by 21? I have, I'm 24. Well, first let me point out that I didn't get into the animation business until I was 40. Great. Okay. Thank so, you. <laughs> I mean, really, truly, I had 20 years of work. Yeah. Related in the media business, right? But I didn't start in animation. I got my first job when I was 40 years old. Mm -hmm. And so while I agree that being young gives you incredible advantages, being older doesn't mean that you don't have a role and that you don't have a place. Here's, you know, again, I, I think that we are in an era that is very unique and that I wish I had had when I was young, which is there are no gatekeepers. There is nobody telling you what to do on your Snapchat or on your Tumblr yeah. or on your YouTube page or on your Instagram. And one of the things that depresses me most about the creative industries mm -hmm. is how rapidly when people get a job, they stop doing stuff on their own. And to me, the magic is the people who are constantly, constantly doing their own work, whether they're being paid for it or not whether they have time for it or not, whether they have families, whether they have two jobs, whatever it is they do in their life, they do the things that are important to them. Yeah. Anyway, last night I was honored to present an award to Butch Hartman that Animation Magazine was giving. He was inducted into their Hall of Fame. And one of the things I pointed out that I recognized when I first met Butch years ago is that he was doing stuff because he had to do it, whether he was getting paid or not. He was working for me at Hanna-Barbera mm -hmm. in just an everyday artist job. But I, when I asked him what else he was doing, he said, well, you know, I've written a play and I'm putting it on in a 99-seat theater <laughs> in, uh, in the Valley. I said, well, huh? Like, why are you doing that? He goes, well, you know, I wrote a sitcom and nobody wanted it. I want people to see it, so I just put it on as a show. And to me, that was not only indicative of him then, he's still that way to this day. Absolutely. He is a person that 
will not give up on doing things that are meaningful to him, that are fun to him, that he... And by the way, in addition to all of the animation work that he does, not only here, but on his own app, the Noog Network, yeah. he has a family foundation that does good works for people around the world. I'm like, really? Do you sleep? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like what... What? So to me, the the people who do work because... They believe in their work, mm -hmm. whether or not anyone else recognizes it, no matter how frustrating the life is out there when you're trying to get your work out and no one will pay attention to you. Those are the people that I know I pay attention to. And frankly, like eventually, those are the people that the world pays attention to. Fred, I want to thank you so much for coming in. This has been just a delight for me as a pop culture enthusiast. Well, I'm so flattered to have been asked. I'm really a fan of the podcast. I mean, obviously, I'm a fan of what goes on at Nick Animation. Yeah. But um, it's really rare, as I told you, like that our part of the business is covered the way that you've done it with the quality work that you have done. And I, I couldn't be more pleased to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, there you have it, everybody. That was our conversation with Mr. Fred Seibert. Big thanks to him for coming in. That was amazing. He was a fan of ours, all time, one of the best producers ever, and he came in and shared his stories. It was absolutely fantastic. So thanks again, Fred. Guys, remember to go to nickanimationpodcast.com for a bunch of extra stuff. Continue liking and subscribing to podcast. Leave us a review if you'd like. It really helps us out. Thanks to the awesome crew who puts this podcast together. This podcast is produced by Jonathan Highlander, Dana vasquez Eberhardt, Kelly Smith, Andrew Hubner. Original music by Useful Creatures. This week's episode edited by Josh Caldwell, Jonathan Highlander. All of the incredible social media for our podcast is made by Narbe Manassians, Sammy Armager, David Watson. And thanks to the man who works at controls and makes me sound better than I have a right to, Manny Grava. Until next time, thanks for listening to the Nickelodeon Animation Podcast and keep watching cartoons. Mm -hmm.